How are you, man? I'm Gil Roth, and you're listening to a bonus episode of my Virtual Memory Show podcast. This is a COVID check-in episode where I record with a past guest of the Virtual Memory Show to find out how they're holding up during the pandemic. As far as how I'm doing, I'm okay. Not a lot to say. Uh, pretty busy with work, between pandemic response stuff, long-term post-pandemic issues, day-to-day -day administration, you know, all that business. It can be a little stressful, but it doesn't feel like I'm just spinning wheels or, or making busy work, so, so that's good. Let's get to today's guest. David Bayerwald is joining me this time from Kingston, New York. David is a musician, songwriter, producer, um, inventor, and now looking to add novelist to that mix. In the 80s, he put out an album called Boomtown with David Ricketts and a band called David and David, then went on to have a solo career, uh, helped write Sheryl Crow's first big album, wrote music for film and TV, including Come What May, the, the love song from Moulin Rouge, and raised a son. Um, lately, he moved from L.A. to uh, the New York area and has been working on a novel about his family's history in Japan, Germany and the U.S. and and their involvement in the intelligence community and what would become the CIA. Um, in the early 90s, David's second solo album after the wonderful Bedtime Stories was a dark piece of work called Triage. And that album went pretty deep into some American slash CIA atrocities, uh, Cold War era stuff, really... Oh, like I say, dark. Um, so when we get talking about the future of the Republic and his his prescient vision for where things have been headed, not just where we're, we are right now, that is what I am vaguely alluding to. I should have been more explicit in, in the course of the, the conversation. I don't like triage as much as David's other work um, because it's less broken love songs and more about the betrayal of America, but I think it's pretty obvious it's because it's really uncomfortable subject matter um, and stuff I should be uh, more attentive to. I ought to give it a, a re-listen sometime soon. As caveats go, uh, David's answers can get a little meandering at times. He's been hanging by himself a lot of this uh, this, this period. Uh, plus, there's maybe another reason that comes up midway through the conversation that, that may help explain things, too. Uh, also, we had a problem with uploading the final wave files for, for this episode. So uh, this one's using his side's MP3 version instead. Only you audio maniacs are going to care about that. Uh, embarrassingly, even I didn't notice much of a difference. Uh, here's me and David. How you been doing? Actually, I, I should ask in a better tone. How are you doing? <laughs> Well, you know, it, uh, it's a uh, it's an ever evolving cycle of feelings. Yeah, was there a a tough sort of transition for you from when we first went into the social distancing, self isolation mode? Because the little that I know of of you know how you were living, I don't know if that was sort of the default for what your days were like. Well, yeah, I mean, I you know, I mean, I've been very. Uh, very much focused on just what I'm doing, but um, you know, it's less about my own life and just about the stuff that's going on uh, around me. I mean, I'm fine essentially. I, you know, I'm, it's, not much has really changed for me. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. Before we get to the the future of the republic, which I know weighs on you pretty heavily, um, you know, just on a personal level, you know, you're you're functioning. Things are are relatively doable. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, yeah, I mean, I'm fine. I you know, I I. Uh, you know, I'm one of the very fortunate people in the world, really, as far as this kind of thing goes. It's a, uh, um, I've never had a job, you know, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'm actually, you know, it's actually on a, on a personal level, it's, you know, I'm sort of reaching out a little bit more to people. It, um, I'm doing things I never did before, like, uh, oh, you know, I'm teaching people guitar on the internet and, uh, um, you know, doing that kind of stuff. So, you know, uh, uh, is that with I'll, people you knew or is this sort of something you're, you're opening up and offering? Well, I haven't you? really gone public with it. Um, 
I don't even remember exactly how it happened. It, somebody did something nice. Um, and I said, you just earned a guitar lesson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so I gave him a guitar. Fortunately, he turned out, you know, he, he's a pretty advanced student. So I was able to go right to the fun stuff, but, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know how good I would be at teaching children at this point. I did that mm -hmm. when I was a teenager, but, um, but that's a long time ago. Yeah. That's a long time ago. And it, and, you know, guitar is a funny thing that way. It's a, you, you know, it's, a, it's a very additive, uh, uh, education. You can't really just start at the fun stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Getting the, the fundamentals and everything and, and repetition, I imagine, repetition. because I never actually studied an instrument. So yeah. Hand strength, you know, I mean, you know, and, and, and when people are starting out, it's, it's tricky. So this guy's been playing since he was, I don't know, 10 or 11. I mean, not, not professionally, but, um, but he's actually really gifted and he's got a great right hand and, um, and he's, and he's a, he's a hard worker and, you know, I'm having fun with him. Nice. I remember the first time we met, like, Jesus, six years ago, um, it was just part of like your, your day-to-day -day routine involved the just working on guitar for however long and then the flashcards and everything else. And, uh, you know, it was the first time I, I, I think I talked with a, a musician and understood what goes into just, just maintaining much less, you know, building on what you have. Yeah. It's, well, you know, it's a, it's, I mean, that's the nice thing about the guitar really is it's like, uh, you know, it's like gardening, you know, you never really get to the end of it. Mm -hmm. Is this something you, you sort of noodle with now just on your own to, to decompress? Does it have any decompressive qualities for you, I guess? Sort oh, of very much so. You... It's very yeah. meditative. Yeah. Cool. You know, mm -hmm. now I, I don't think we've talked about it. I haven't talked about it on the podcast, but you've been working on a book um, that is out of your hands right now. Or is oh, it actually, something that's returned? Actually, to you? it's 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 been returned to me with copious notes. Yes. And is the process of working on that something that's helping you with just the general, um, you know, atmosphere and and you know distance? Are you spending time on that that you you know are glad to be spending nowadays? Oh, I, that's that's all I really do. I mean, you know, it's either that or um, cleaning my windows with rubbing alcohol. You know, um, <laughs> uh, or you know bugging friends and, you know, chatting and, you know, insulting, uh, uh, Republicans. <laughs> yeah. I, I just noticed you haven't posted, uh, pictures of documentation on Instagram lately, all the things that were being incorporated into the oh, novels. So. Yeah. Well, you know, I packed all that stuff up. Um, and I, uh, you know, I have to get back into that. It, um, what I wanted to do is, before I take any more photos of those photos, I wanted to build a little, um, uh, I, I don't know what you'd call it. A, 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 archive? Because it, not so much an archive. No, it's a, you know, like a, a, a little, a little machine that I can flatten them with. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's a type of scanner that like has that, but I don't know what all the, the, how much it costs, what you call it, et cetera. But, but yeah. Yeah. I think I'm just going to make one. Um, out of a heavy piece of metal. Um, I'd make a bad heavy metal guitar joke, but whatever. That's, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you said you found yourself reaching out to, to people from your past, just old friends or, you know, is it? Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of old girl, a lot of old girlfriends, you know, I mean, the funny thing is, is, that, you know, I mean, actually an old girlfriend of mine, uh, reached out to me and, you know, and, uh, and we were talking and, um, and she said, well, you know, you know, I, I just think the world now looks like it always did to you. <laughs> but yeah, now, was, it for, uh, now it does for everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> One of the bullet points on my question list is just triage with a question mark uh, about that, that solo album of yours and the apocalyptic vision of America that it, it includes. Um, uh, yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of been my, uh, it's been my, my the hallway that I've been wandering for close to 30 years now. So, uh, I, you know, one happy benefit is that a lot of the people that I used to know don't think I'm as crazy as I seem at the time. <laughs> I'm sure they still think you're crazy just in a different way, but, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> actually no, people are, people are, you know, you know, uh, uh, 
good friend of mine was a guy that produced uh, uh, the f- first record I did, you know, as an artist. Uh, Bedtime Stories? Oh, uh, oh no, okay. No, uh, Boomtown. Yeah. yeah. And um, and he was like, oh, well, it's a combination of, of, of what's going on and also as he sort of discovered, you know, well, I, you know, I gave him, I gave him, uh, uh, chapters from my book and, um, you know, a lot of things that maybe were confusing to people about me in the past make a lot more sense in the context of my upbringing and also just the, you know, the fact that things that I was saying, you know, were true and that I wasn't actually insane. And so, you know, and he's always been very hard on me. <laughs> um, well, I remember miss uh, when you were explaining the book to me, my, my miss terminology about it and, and you know, how I rate you got over that. And just that, that um, I, I guess, you know, that, that sense of the, history you were you were discussing actually being informed and not fantasy is something that that you know can freak people out or take them out of their their framework all of this is like elliptically alluding to the book i don't know if you want to mention anything as to what it's about well or, sure I'll, I'll, okay sure. I'll, I'll tell you about it yeah tell people what what's you know how, how would you describe or how have you described the book well i mean i'll just des- describe it the, the way i came to starting to write it um which was I was, you know, closing up this old family home. And, uh, well, I mean, my, you know, to, as as a preamble, you know, there's always been a certain cloaking in mystery and misdirection. And uh, I'm not going to say dishonesty, but uh, certainly mystery and misdirection about my father's side of the family. Um. And so I was closing up this old house, which was already very fraught because it was in it was in Brentwood and it, and it was during the uh, wildfires. So there were you know there were three <laughs> three three hills surrounding me that were threatening to burn, and it, you know and these very high, unnerving California Santana winds. And you can just see these uh, embers flying around. And, you know, the whole place is just like an explosive. Um, so that was alarming. And I and I almost threw these boxes away that I found um, without looking in them because I was in such a hurry just to get stuff. You know, I had dumpsters and I was just throwing all kinds of stuff away. And um, something said, Dave, you really ought to look in these boxes. And so I did. And one of the first things I found was... Um, along with a bunch of junk, uh, was uh, a box full of letters, including one from Franklin Roosevelt, uh, several from Einstein, uh, a bunch of letters from the Roth, from uh, various Rothschilds, uh, uh, and, and a speech that, and my grandfather's obituary from New York Times, and a speech that he'd given when he he'd become a an instructor at the intelligence school in uh, at the Presidio in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Um, he he'd lived in Japan for thirty years. He'd moved there in nineteen ten, and then you know they left rather suddenly uh, in December of nineteen forty, so a year before Pearl Harbor. But you know it was clear that there was something very serious going to happen there. And uh, I'll just all this stuff, photographs, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of photographs that he'd taken and, and some odd pictures of him. I, you know, I found a picture of him, uh, Jesus, with the crown prince of Japan in Berlin. And he was clearly in charge of all these places that he was, you know, he, he wasn't like a sort of, you know, you know, the Japanese are very hierarchical about their images, you know. Yeah. And and he he was in the center of all these pictures. A picture of him in the in the center of uh, the Japanese Parliament. A uh, um, picture of him signing the uh, the first trade pact between Germany and Japan um, with a bunch of you know just all this kind of stuff. And you know and, and when I meant you know when I say kind of misdirection and mystery, my father 
posited his father as this kind of simple, kindly seller of inks and dyes. Uh, you know? <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, usually when people make up stories about their parents, you know, they're, well, I mean, my, you know, one would think that he would have told me this stuff. Um, and he, and he told me that his grandfather, my father, my great grandfather was this, was this school teacher. Um, in, in Frankfurt, uh, and you know, with a little bit of digging, what I found, well, one of the things I found was, was a list of the board of directors of, he, he was the headmaster of the school in Frankfurt called the philanthropine. Uh, and the philanthropine was this very special school, and, and it was started by um, the first patriarch of the Rothschild banking family. And they trained, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, essentially the people that created 20th century banking, central banks, you know, Jacob Schiff and the Warburgs and... Uh, 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 August Belmont came through there. You know, I mean, it was just it's this incredible, you know, and basically the list of this board of directors, this was in 1898, were the creators of modern banking. They all came out of the school. And, and, and so I realized that there was this network of these guys because I'd always sort of wondered how my grandfather and his brother sort of were able to do some of the things that they did and you know, um, yeah, it was just you know it was a mystery to me. So uh, ha knowing about this this sort of network of of acquaintances and people and connections and things like that that they had made a lot of sense all of a sudden. Um, and so then I started digging. You know, I came to New York, and. Uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of family papers at Columbia University, and there are a lot more at, uh, uh, well, it's, it's a combination of the, Jew, the, the Leo Beck Center and the Jewish hmm. cultural something or other. Anyway, um, they've got about 900 pages there of stuff. And, you know, when I got to New York, I, you know, I called them. And I said, Hi, you know, my name's Dave Barewald, and I'm trying to find out information about this and that. And, uh, I just left a message. It was a cold call. And, you know, somebody called me back within like two minutes. <laughs> I said, wow, yeah. that was, that's quick work. And, and he said, oh, you know, very well name. You know, that's, that means something around here. And I, <laughs> and I was like, are you kidding me? And um, so, yeah, so, uh, you know, there are Leo Beck and, uh, oh, Jesus, Menachem Begin and uh, 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 just all these people. Yeah. Um, we're all part of this, this, this kind of group. Um, and it, you know, at first I was actually more thinking about my great uncle who was this kind of, you know, he was a chairman of this group called the joint distribution committee, which, which was a major, um, major, I mean, it was a massive refugee agency, again, founded by the Rothschilds and the shifts, um, and they, you know, had food kitchens and all this. And I knew about that side of it. But I, what I didn't know was that um, it was actually a two-track uh, agency um, that was also heavily involved in things like passport forgery. You know, they had they had a fleet of ships that, you know, they... Yeah. Um, they had a factory that cranked out fake uniforms. Um, they supplied weapons to Polish partisans. One of the one of the director, the European director, was this fantastic character named uh, Packy Schwartz, who was a real hero, very you know, I mean, a physical hero, very daring do kind of a guy. Um, there's this incredible story of him saving uh, something like five or five hundred people that were being sent to a concentration camp by by making a deal to bribe an SS colonel. And when the time came to pay him, they, he just shot him. 
<laughs> which I thought was a terrific idea. Yeah. Um, I'm always down. Anything that involves shooting Nazis, I'm I'm good with. So yeah, I'm I'm fine with that myself. I, I I'm kind of itching to do that myself these days. Hmm. But that basically evolved into what's become well, the 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 shape and structure or the history of this book. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, well, it was just it was a it was an evolving process, you know. I mean, it, you know, when you start digging, it, you know, this is sort of if it's not hidden history, it's certainly obscured. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the the secret, I was gonna say secret history is an okay term for it. It doesn't imply, you know, a, 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 I think conspiratorial was the way I put it when you, you corrected me, uh, back in your, your old house. Well, um, there's a, you know, listen, I mean, I, I apologize if I got t testy no, about no, that. I, it's just, I realized that, you know, my terms were loose and, you know, this is something you really should understand what you're saying. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not like uh, you know, this is this is not some kind of flat Earth thing, you know. I mean, it's a and also it's a novel too, you know. I mean, I, I um, I'm having a lot of fun with with it. I mean, one of the great things about this kind of world is as you dig into it, you start meeting all these just fascinating people. I don't mean in real life. I mean in you know in uh, again when you get anecdotes like you know shooting the SS guy. That's <laughs> well, that kind of but you know, I mean, that's that's one guy. I mean, you know, there's. Yeah. It, it's it's uh, it's an astonishing collection. Kain Weitzman and you know uh, my fa my new favorite is uh, well, there's two. Um, this woman named Emily Hahn, who I highly recommend everybody Google immediately. She's just delightful, and um, and this fantastic guy uh, who both my grandfather and father knew. This guy named Israel Epstein, who was a Russian spy. He was a Chinese spy. <laughs> Chinese, you know, he was he was basically an all-purpose. Uh, uh, well, I guess you, I guess I guess you would call him a communist. Um, what he really was was a sort of a human rights act advocate. <laughs> but uh, but just a, another fantastic figure. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of these people, you know, left behind letters and books that they wrote. And so you get a good sense of their voice and who they were. And there's just, a, you know, it's a tremendously rich field to, to just wander around in and just meet all these fantastic people at these really pivotal moments in history. I did just Google Emily Hahn, and I'll put a link to that in the, the episode notes for this one, because just what I saw at a glance, yeah, that, that looks like a fascinating person to, to oh, she's, she's start looking into. And, and Israel Epstein, the best. Check him out. Google him. He's, he's <laughs> I mean, one of the fun things about this book is, you know, it's, 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 it's designed as an entertainment. I mean, it really is. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a big honking entertainment thing um but if you're of the inclination and you think my god this can't be true and you google it it'll actually make the top of your head explode <laughs> awesome now, i i again you're gonna cut me some slack the way i phrase this does living in that world as you're working on this book help at all in terms of of how you're coping with our overall day-to-day -day thing, what we're going through right now? Or is well, it making yeah. more horrified? Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, listen, you know, <laughs> I've, I've been this horrified for a long time, like I said. <laughs> yeah. But but uh, um, what it does do is it, you know, I, I am going around the world in 80 days sitting at my desk. You know, I, uh, rather than being in New York, I find myself in Shanghai in 1937 or... Uh, or, uh, you know, Cairo in 1922, you know, um, Port Said, you know. Um, so it is, you know, I can travel in my imagination um, by just spending time there. And, you know, just you sort of lose yourself there and you forget where you are, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, you just uh, moved house in the past couple of weeks? Yeah. Or are you yeah. still, okay. Yeah. How was that, that process given, you know, all the constraints and everything we're going through? It was an elaborate, uh, 
<laughs> you know, you know, it was like planning a heist or a, or a military uh, was like airlocks and stuff. You know, you put everything in one room, wait for the other guys to pick it up or, or kind of. Well, I mean, uh, um, well, very early on, I had developed a state of alarm um, that was probably, you know, that seemed at the time really paranoid to people. But I just figured, what the hell? And I, uh, you know, really early on, I bought a uh, kind of excessive complement of uh, protective equipment. Mm-hmm. Um, um, including this kind of Tyvex moon suit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not really a moon suit, it's, it's, but it's basically, it's an, it's an airtight overall. Mm-hmm. Um, now, remember, I've gone into pharmaceutical manufacturing lines, so yeah, I've I've done the full bunny suit, you know, with with the wrap, not not the full gigantic one where they pump air in and all that, but no, no, I, yeah, I don't have that. Everything up to that point, I've I've had to do. So, yeah. yeah, so you know, yeah, so I have one of those one of those Tyvek suits, um, a lot of rubber gloves, uh, a lot of really high test cleaning uh, cleaning liquids and stuff. Um, my favorite is this combination of hydrogen peroxide and uh, 99% pure uh, isopropyl alcohol. Nice. Um, so that's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty strong stuff. Mm. So, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, um, I, I, I made my own, um, I didn't want to use up, uh, you know, N95 masks. Mm-hmm. So I made my own <laughs> <laughs> thing out of a uh it's a it's actually it's a i highly recommend this for people that are extremely paranoid it's a it's a full face uh, snorkeling mask um okay yeah so it covers your entire face and it has these air intakes that uh that face face backward you know because you're you're you know because you're paddling so it so it faces backward and if you just if you just covered cover those air intakes with a variety of, of um, filtering materials. Uh, it's actually, uh, uh, it's actually really effective. And, you know, again, I thought, I thought I was nuts. Um, but a friend of mine is <laughs> actually a bioethicist, but she, but she's at Johns Hopkins and they, uh, uh, they've drafted her into the emergency room. Mm-hmm. Um, and when she, when she, when that happened, I said, you know, this is going to sound a little crazy, but you know, I have this snorkeling mask <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and at first she was a little dismissive of it. And so I did a little, she said, well, send me the documentation. So I, uh, so I did a little more deep and research and it turns out that there's this Indian surgeon that had the same idea. Um, and he actually went further and, and, and designed all these, uh, you know, CNC, uh, uh, molds for, uh, adapters for various kinds of air filters. Hmm. And so, you know, um, Johns Hopkins is, you know, is looking at these things now. Uh, so that was kind of a, that was kind of a fun, yeah. a fun thing. Uh, again, I mean, you've always had a, from the time I've connected with you you've, you've had this inventor side also which again, yeah, i like in, I, I like i like inventing stuff i do yeah and the ability to at least fabricate something or come up with a prototype and and figure out where to go from there so yeah yeah that's uh better than i do i just hide from all human contact i realized this weekend it's been at least five or six weeks since i set foot in another building besides my house yeah yeah. I literally just haven't walked into another place. You know, I'll go out and run, I'll do stuff, but I've not like gone grocery shopping or anything like that. So uh, that's my maybe over the top way of dealing with this, but yeah, you've seen where I live. So it's, it's isolated enough. I can sort of get away with it, but yeah. Yeah. Still. Yeah. Um, able to, to read and focus on non, non work on your book stuff are you able to, to decompress with other art forms um not so much uh, well sort of you know i kind of you know i i sort of uh 
I'm really appreciating the T Turner Classic Movie Channel. Um, oh yeah. Um, for I, for some reason, I've, I've developed this this bizarre antipathy towards Fred Astaire, though I don't know why. <laughs> but I just can't. <laughs> well, singing stand in the rain it. on yesterday, so you get the Gene Kelly side instead. You get to you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there's something you know. I, well, they had a they had a uh, uh, you know a festival of Fred Astaire movies, and you know the first one I was like, oh cool, Fred Astaire, and then. I was like, you know, God, he is just a fucking smarmy prick. <laughs> he has a very punchable look. There's just something about that. that He's just so smirky. Demeanor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Smug and smirk. And I'm just like, and, and uh, I, yeah, I just was like, I, I, feel, I feel the same way about Robert Wagner. You know, there's just something about him that just makes me, it's just yeah. some kind of, it just Trigger. drives me nuts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, but spending time with a uh, with TCM is the 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 decompression for you. Yes, yes, TCM. I've, I've also I, I, you can edit this out if you'd like, but um, I found a I found a bag of psilocybin mushrooms, and so nice. I've been smoke I've been smoking them. That keeps me kind of, you know, it, it doesn't seem to have an effect on my ability to do anything. It's just sort of. Uh, in fact, it doesn't have. Oh, sorry. It, it, yeah, it's just sort of a, it, it. It provides a sort of. Well, there's a distancing that happens. You know, I started. Yeah. You know, I had I went through this really, uh, really, really aggressive uh, post traumatic stress um, treatment. Not long after my son was born, well, he was probably about three or four. It was about a year long and and uh, highly illegal. <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, but she used, she used a variety. Her husband was a chemist hmm. and she used a variety of various, um, you know, drugs like this, uh, as a means of allowing you to confront whatever it is that caused the trauma in the first place without actually creating more trauma. Hmm. Um, I started out with a more normal treatment. Uh, called uh, EMDR. And actually, I had a lot of success with that. But um, in the course of that, my therapist uh, and I stumbled over some things that were a little bit too much for her to take. Mm -hmm. And she said, and she just gave me this number and said, I didn't give you this number. <laughs> and I met this wonderful, <laughs> wonderful lady in uh, in Silver Lake. Um, and it's 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 the same kind of thing, you know. It it enables you to look at things without bringing uh, velocity to it, uh, yeah. Without bringing judgment or velocity, or you know, it just allows you to just sort of observe it without, um, you know, without damaging yourself. Gotcha. I've never tried any any hallucinogens of any kind. I I missed out in my college years and really. Should well, have. I Although mean, at the time, I don't think it would have benefited me the way you're talking about here. That's. Uh, I, I think you know. I think the notion of using them as a party drug is just insane. Uh, um, I think they need to be. I think they're really valuable, uh, but I think they do need to be uh, treated with care and with intent and with mm -hmm. um, with a purpose. Yeah. Um, because they do have, you know, they, uh, therapeutically, you know, they, they've had incredible luck with like alcoholism, uh, prison recidivism. Um, uh, so there is, there, there is, and that's actually coming now into, into more sort of mainstream thought. Oh yeah. But, I think there's a UK clinic that's, that's really working on that now, especially. I just saw something in the last couple of weeks that there's a, a, Institute in the, the UK that's really trying to advance this. Um, yeah, they're doing a lot of work at McGill and Toronto, and um, uh, you know, it's it's it, it works. I mean, it actually does work. It's just you know, when it's illegal, that kind of makes it a little more difficult for people, for particularly the therapists. <laughs> yeah, sure, but that's uh, that's helping you. I don't want to say cope, but just in terms of you know getting through the days that we're, we're going through. Yeah. I mean, there's, there is something about it that, um, you know, I'm not like high or anything like that. It's just sort of, uh, I guess so you're not tripping right now, are you? That's, <laughs> I'll feel bad if I didn't pick up on that this whole time. <laughs> a, a little bit. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. 
Again, I'm a horrible judge at this. That's why I like doing these things face to face instead of over uh, over the mic. But <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I don't think you would know if, if, if you know. I'm really not tripping. I mean, I'm not hallucinating or anything. It's just, uh, um, uh, it's just it's just kind of something. It's like drinking tea for me now. Yeah. Huh. Let's see. Maybe it's something. Next time I'm over there, we'll uh, you know. I'm just kidding, uh, because I would end up having to drive afterwards, and that would be a horrible, horrible scene. Um, I, I, I don't think you'd have a problem. I mean, again, I mean, it, it has almost no effect. It's just sort of, um, it is it is so subtle that sometimes I forget that it's even there, you know? Yeah. And as far as future of the Republic, which we mentioned at the top of this conversation, mm. and it really has been the... Your social media presence very much, you know, as you said, focused on, on you know, bashing Republicans and getting out some of the threats that we're we're facing. How uh, how worried are you? Oh, I think <laughs> I think this is probably it. I think this is probably the most dangerous moment in human history. Hmm. Um, not just because of the virus, um, although that's certainly a part of it, but also, you know, because of climate change and because uh, the the flowering of of American fascism, of uh, you know what's you know the uh, the flowering of fascism globally. Um, uh, you know, I. I uh, this is this environment that we're living in now. It's going to, um, I, you know, it's it, the the increase internationally of xenophobia. Uh, um, I mean, yeah, refugees. Um, I, you know, we're I, we're put it this way. It it could be a transformative moment where where uh, the oligarchs and plutocrats understand that, <laughs> you know, that they can't take everything um, without consequence. But I don't think that's the case. Um, I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't see an I don't see that degree of enlightenment in our political leadership anywhere. Um, uh, You've you got know, a... A uh, son who is post college now. Uh, he, he's just about to go into his last year. Okay. In terms of how he, either how he sees the the future or how you talk about that with him, in terms of hey man, sorry we left you this planet. Is that the sort of conversations you guys have at all? Uh, about yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he you know he knows me and he knows I've been fighting. I've been fighting for decades. Uh, yeah. Uh, and he knows that he knows that I, it's not my fault. Um, uh, he's also less, you know, well, he, he, either, I guess he's less romantic than I am. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, this is a very pragmatic generation, um, that is coming out. People, the kids, his age, at least the ones that I've met, hmm. um, which I think is a shame in a way. I mean, you know, they're, they're not as dreamy as we were. Um, uh, but, you know, but, hmm? go on. I was going to say just from the getting beaten down by history for the last 20 years or. Well, you know, I mean, if you picture, you know, I think probably the 30 year olds have it the worst, but, but 20 year olds don't have it that great either. You know, for a 30 year old, for your 10th birthday, you get nine eleven, Yeah. And then when you graduate from high school, you, you enter the 2008 recession and, and then kids, you know, every time you go to school, you have to wonder if somebody's going to come in and shoot you. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, th these are, th this was a tough upbringing for them, you know? And, um, you know, Becker, you know, he was, he was, uh, he was three when nine eleven happened. Um, 
And, you know, he's, you know, he, he's had an alarming upbringing. And I, you know, a lot of people, <clears throat> you know, give the, give his generation a, a lot of grief for, for their negativity. But, um, but I, you know, I think we should be, I think we should be sympathetic. And I'm no. not saying, and he's, he's not negative. He's, you know, he's, a, he's, you know, he, but he's just very focused on, sort of on, you know, doing what he needs to do in order to prosper and, and survive in an incredibly hostile environment. And have they talked about his college um, holding classes in person uh, next fall or are things still totally ambival- or ambiguous? It's very ambi- ambiguous. Um, yeah. Um, they, they don't really know what's going to I mean, they have this big, beautiful campus, all these gorgeous buildings. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, that's not what the university is. You know, the university is, is about the transmission of ideas. And, Conversation. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, expertise, get, getting, you know, getting fundamental getting important fundamental information correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, definitely. Having, having people challenge your preconceptions, you know, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. It's a lot tougher to do on a Zoom screen or whatever the hell they're, they're using for for connecting yeah. like that. Yeah, there's uh, not the, uh, the, the, the bull sessions, you know, in the coffee shop in the middle of the night, you know. Yeah. Yeah, um, I had one... Uh, one teacher who was on this series who said the um actually a a columnist i was reading i remember correctly who said this semester was okay because he'd met all the students and had classes in person with him but he's just worried about next fall when it's students where they never had that chance for the the interpersonal thing where it's all just mediated by screen but yeah i mean i would hope that you know depending on the class sizes um that 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 the teachers will, you know, will seek out personal one-on-one time with their students um, yeah. as much as possible. I mean, I would hope. Yeah, um, it's still just that that the screen being the 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 form of mediation as opposed yeah. to you know yeah. the desk, which yeah. again I've been dealing with for a month plus now with with these shows. But uh, you know, it, it's a nice approximation of things. But um, I guess it's a, a last question: Is there? somewhere you you're, you're just dying to go, uh, that, that, you know, if, if we were just able to go here, I would feel like we were past the, the pandemic concern, either restaurant or library, or, you know, just sitting down with a friend in a bar. Well, I mean, all those would be nice. You know, I I would like to see, (laughs) I'd like to see a little bit more sense from, you know, I, I mean, Huntington Beach, I know very well. I used to go surfing yeah. down there. Um, I can't believe that they're that f- stupid. Yeah. I, I you know, I, I, this, you know, the fishers, you know, I, I would like to see, I, w- I listen, I would like to see negative growth of the virus. I would like to see negative growth of the death rate before people start Oh, I'm with you. I'm not saying anything like open the state. I just mean like something symbolic for you that would say, oh, this this is uh, we're far enough past this that I'm comfortable going to, you know, this restaurant well, or that beach. Or, yeah, I would like I I would like to go to Kyoto. <laughs> <laughs> now, now that I've been and it was the the last trip Amy and I took, we went in mid, mid-February on a business trip to Japan. We did yeah, Tokyo, Kyoto was, and Osaka. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we filled you in on all that that stuff and it was just we got back all of this went down um and we thought you know if that's the last trip we got to take that was an awfully good trip to to close out on for a while so kyoto is heaven on earth i think yeah Um, well they were ecstatic because all the tourists of the chinese tourists were already barred from entering uh uh, japan so there was no tourism uh, not as much tourism in, in a bunch of the sites they wanted to show off for us so that was oh wow we, we didn't know they literally stopped and took pictures of an empty parking lot by the the golden temple because they were just like 
no one is going to believe that this parking lot was empty. This is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, uh, really? Like, oh, yeah, this would totally be filled with buses full of Chinese tourists. And there's no one here. My God, Gil, you don't understand. And they were just taking picture after picture of an empty parking lot before taking us up to the temple. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I can't imagine. I mean, you know, yeah, Kyoto without tour. I mean, my God, that would be that would be heaven on earth. Uh, A little like New York City, apparently now, where uh, all my friends who are in the city are just saying, yeah. There's no, you look out the window and there's no cars and nobody's walking around out there. No, uh, you know, I mean, you know, one of the things, you know, like for instance, um, uh, democratic socialism apparently was a result of the 1918 flu in Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. um, and one could hope that we may emerge from this with some sort of sensible, uh, economic program that would include a national health system. Um, you know, one would hope that there would be, that we would learn something from all this. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it would be nice. I, it, I'm not sure that we're, I'm not sure that as a species we're capable of learning anything at the moment. Uh, I like to think, you know, people can take this as a, wow, these are the things we need to do to make sure if this happens again, we're in better shape. But you, you've seen as much as I have about all the, the, the scapegoating and the ignoring ah, yeah. science and everything else. But uh, <coughs> yeah, know, it's, um, it's, yeah. it's, you know, it, to me that, you know, you know, the, the horror and the grief uh, you know, you're an imaginative person and I'm an imaginative person. I can imagine these things. Um, th that horror and that grief is almost uh, outshadowed by um, the horror and grief at how failed a civilization we are. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, and, and, and in a sense, you know, that is something that plays into this book because that, and, and that is something that makes this a haunting process for me is because I'm kind of painting a picture of how we came to this place. Um, I mean, the working title, you know, was virus of gold. I think I'm going to have to change that now. <laughs> Jeez. <Okay. laughs> but that's, yeah. Because that's kind of what, you know, about the, it, because it, it plays into a big as a big aspect of the book in its larger thing is, is the, uh, um, is the, the, the money that came out of World War II mm -hmm. and, and, and what that did to corporations and industry. And that we've just been sort of gradually seeing this kind of, uh, de-evolution into a, you know, kind of a pre-democratic, uh, society. Yeah. Um, so that haunts me in the writing of this thing. I'm looking forward to reading it. I know I didn't get to that, that earlier version PDF. I apologize, but you know, I, I look forward to, to actually going into the next draft when you're, you're ready to share. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I'm going to deliver it. My, well, my deadline is August 15th. And that's when I give it to my agent. Um, and, you know, we're, we're hoping to go out uh, to the, to the uh, publishers in uh, mid, mid fall. So it's not a huge wait. Um, and I've got other stuff to read. I've got all those Philip Carr, Bernie Gunther novels. You've read yeah. those, right? Okay. No, yeah, I've got a no, no, no. Oh, you never have? No. Oh gosh. Uh, uh, Private Eye, in uh nazi germany oh wow that's all you need uh, and it jumps in time each book you know covers different eras and stuff but essentially world war one vet who becomes a private investigator during the rise of the nazis there that's everything uh you will there are 14 of these you will i i will send you a link to it you can go nuts on yeah that, yeah that sounds like those. that sounds right up, right up my alley <laughs> yeah I, I, <laughs> as i was saying it, I'm like well surely he's read philip carr by now but yeah no i'll 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 send you a link i may even send you a bunch of copies so you know once i get your your new address but anyway david uh thanks for coming on and well, um, thank you for having it thank you for doing this too i think it's i think you're doing a valuable service for people um thanks 
and uh, and it's, uh, yeah. it's 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 a good thing. I'm glad you're you're doing okay in this world. Uh, like from what I knew of how you were living lately, I just figured your personal accommodation wouldn't be too screwed up. But your mindset, I figure, you know, and and what America's become is well, I, that's I, what I crashed. I crashed pretty hard. Um, yeah, I did crash pretty hard about four or five days ago. I yeah. had one of those one of those William Styron kind of <laughs> yeah kind of bottom of the ocean sort of things. Um, but anyway, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Enjoy enjoy the weather. It's, yeah, I, I, I assume I, your weather is similar to mine. Oh yeah, uh, I I ran nine miles this morning. That big wow. that big giant hill that you come into my town when you, you came out for Thanksgiving that that yeah. big yeah, yeah, yeah I ran that I I 49 years I've never run up that that hill before the mountain but I uh I did that this morning did another five miles after that and decided you know I don't need to make a new episode today I can I could take some time off so yeah <laughs> yeah carefully your carefully your shins yeah, they've been fine. It was my knee and calf I was worried about. Everything's been good. I've been doing 20 miles a week and, and doing that more than driving. So Yeah, my shins always got really messed up um, yeah. running for some reason. Yeah, hill, I just really hills felt will it get on. You too. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Um, cool, man. Thank Be you well. for, uh, for calling. And, and uh, uh, you know, we'll get through this one way or another. Definitely. And I will send you goofy pictures of my dog, Bendico, who you made a good impression on back at Thanksgiving. I love your dog. He is awesome. Okay. <laughs> Be well, David. Thanks. All right. You too. That was David Bayerwald. He's on Twitter as D Bayerwald one, which is D as in David, B A E R W A L D and the number one. There'll be a link to that in the episode and show notes for this one. His Twitter bio reads as follows, FDR Democrat, Grammy, Golden Globe, International Film Music Award songwriter, now novelist, Boomtown, Triage, Cheryl Crow, Moulin Rouge, Come What May. David's music's been part of my soundtrack since I was, gee, since I was <laughs> 17 and discovered Boomtown when a pal of mine put that on a, a mixtape for me. Um, you should go seek out David's work. Feel free to engage with him on Twitter. He's good people, and I hope that comes across from this this conversation. Uh, I got to read some of the novel he's working on, although I said I didn't look at the the PDF draft. I didn't have time to look at the PDF draft he sent me a while back. Um, I can't wait to see the final version. We've had conversations about a lot of things he alludes to in this episode in terms of his family's history. It is harrowing. It is documented. Um, it's... It's going to make for, I think, really good fiction. And we'll be back tomorrow with another COVID check-in. Uh, if you want to send me a little update to read on the air or have something you want to share with the listeners, let me know and we'll set something up. I'm at groth18, G-R-O-T-H-1-8, at gmail.com. You can also DM me on Twitter or Instagram. It's VMS pod there. And you can find uh, my contact info at our websites, vmspod.com and chimeraobscura.com slash VM. You can find a link to the COVID-19 sessions at both of those sites with all of these daily episodes. You can also just subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show via iTunes, Spotify, or other podcatchers by grabbing our RSS feed off of those sites uh, to make sure you get every episode and all of the archives of 370 or so full-length podcasts that I did before the, uh, well, in the before times. And in the before times, I always recorded in person, but now I have to use Zencaster.com so I can record remotely. Uh, if you're interested in using it for this sort of purpose, it is Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. So no final E. The hobby level, I think, is still open essentially as pro. Pro level, which I subscribe to now, costs 20 bucks a month. But... um my Patreon supporters more than cover the expenses for this show, especially since I'm no longer spending money on parking, tolls, subway trips, pie, and other stuff that I would pick up for uh, in-person episodes of the show. I'm also saving so much time um, not driving in to New York or upstate or, or wherever the hell I would go to do these things. In the post-pandemic times, we'll see about how I can balance the in-person ones with more of these remotes, but... 
Anyway, what I want to say is uh, I don't need your money. I do need your support. Uh, So a nice email uh, about the show or a particular episode of what it might mean to you. Um, That sort of thing helps keep me going. Anyway, uh, if you do have money to spare, don't give it to me. Give it to the artists, writers, creative people, and other people in need, uh, people whose work you like. Go find their Patreons, GoFundMes, Kickstarters, Indiegogos, tip jars, whatever. If you can't find somebody who you want to donate to and you do have money to spare, give to your local food bank, find other charities. Um, it's cliche. We're all in this together. Anything you can do to help, um, you should help. I'm Gil Roth. It is Cinco de Mayo 2020. I don't drink, so it's going to be more of a boring day for me. Uh, But anyway, this is a bonus episode of my Virtual Memory Show podcast. Thanks for listening. Keep the conversation going, stay safe, and wash your damn hands.